All right, if you uh, missed last week, that was laying a bit of groundwork for this week's message. Uh, last week, in addition to recognizing our first responders and, and thanking them, we also gave attention to the daily battle that we are in. As Paul said, it's a battle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic forces in this present darkness, against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. So it's an incredible battle. And daily, not to minimize what happened at, at uh, 9-11, but daily there's a carnage that is greater than any act of terror that has occurred anywhere in the world. Every single day there's tremendous spiritual carnage as Satan schemes and, and figures out how to take as many people as possible with him to his eternal destiny in the lake of fire. And every day many, many people go into eternity apart from Christ. Now as a church... We're called to stand against the schemes of Satan. We're called to stand in the gap and to rescue those who are being carried away to death. And you may remember last week I mentioned there are two things that Satan will try to do to neutralize us as the church to keep us from rescuing people from eternal torment. The first thing is he will attempt, uh, for the individual believer, he will attempt to get us to sin. And he does that because he knows sin breaks our fellowship with God. When our fellowship with God is broken, the, the spirit is quenched. The spirit who indwells every believer is, is quenched. Our source of power is cut off, and we're wounded spiritually and basically taken out of the battle uh, by sin. Secondly, we said Satan is going to try to convince us there is plenty of time. Yes, people need to know about the gospel. Yes, people need to know about their eternal destiny, but we don't have to get in the conflict right now. We can just relax. We can get together and enjoy our Bible studies and our time with friends or work on advancing our career, whatever it is, but the gospel can wait until later. But we don't know how long a person has. We don't know how many days they've been given. We don't know when God will stop dealing with them. We don't know when time here on earth is going to run out and Jesus is going to return for reward for the believer, but for judgment for the unbeliever. And so we can't fall to the illusion that there is plenty of time. We've, we've got to wake up and do the work that God has called us to do. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 9, verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And that is certainly an appropriate thought for us to hang on to today. Night is coming. No one can look around as what, what is happening in our world today and not say that night isn't coming. Night is coming, and at that point, no one can work, and there is no plan B. Extending the kingdom of God and advancing the gospel is up to us as his followers. You know, as a church, we don't simply exist for us. We uh, come together to worship, to study God's word. We come together for encouragement and accountability. We come to prepare for the mission that God has given us. And that means we can't stay in here huddled up in headquarters. We've got to get out onto the battlefield. And hopefully, as we go out from here each week, that is exactly what is on our hearts and our minds, that we're going to fulfill our mission. During the first few months of this year, our staff uh, met and studied and discussed and prayed uh, for quite some time to clarify our mission. We wanted to be sure that everyone who's a part of the body of Christ that we call Geyer Springs understands our mission and that we're all on the same page regarding our mission. Now, if you've been around church very long, you know that the month of September on our church calendar is kind of like January. It's a fresh start to a new year. Kids are back in school. Families are back from vacation. They're back from uh, weekends at the lake. And, and the past two weeks, if you've been here the past two weeks, the past two weeks around here have been very energizing. Uh, we've restarted our Bible study classes. We've uh, restarted our midweek activities. And, and with all of that in mind and thinking about the start on a new year, this is a good time to remind ourselves of what we're about and why we're here. Now, you have probably seen um, that new mission statement that our team crafted. You've seen it in publications. You've heard our staff perhaps say it in, in uh, various settings. That's because we want every member of the body to know our mission and to align with our mission and commit themselves to fulfilling our mission. So what is our mission? Our mission is very simply this. Geyer Springs Baptist Church exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. And we want that ingrained in, in every one of us. Now, you know, when a business creates a mission statement, they don't have to think about what we have to think about. What we have to think about, is this biblical? 
In fact, that's where we start. Our starting point is, is Scripture, and there are two passages from which we have drawn our mission statement as a church. Jesus' final words are recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, a very familiar passage to many of you. After the resurrection, after Jesus' appearances to the disciples and, and many others, and before he ascended back into heaven, he made very clear what his followers are to do. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore... Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's our objective. That's our mission. That's what's been given by the Lord to us, to make disciples, to lead people to become followers of Christ. And it's pretty simple and straightforward. But it requires getting outside of these walls. We don't have the luxury uh, of staying here in our comfort zone and calling out to people and inviting them to come in. That's not what he told us to do. And I don't know when. I, I know that it was that way for many, many years when I was a child through college, early adulthood, growing up. For some reason, we thought that was a good idea. For us to tell them, hey, you need to come in here and we do all these events and have all these things happen and perhaps we see many numbers of people respond to the gospel message, but they never became disciples, they never became followers of Christ. It was never a good idea. The idea, what Jesus said clearly here, is we're to go, we're to meet people where they are, we're to develop a relationship with them and lead them to a discipling process. We're to make disciples by discipling people to faith in Christ and then discipling them in their faith, helping them grow to the point that they're able to make disciples. That's what glorifies God. We glorify God by obeying his command. And he is glorified when we lift up Jesus and men are drawn to salvation. Now, we're going to be talking about this mandate. You're going to hear about this more and more and more because we want it to pervade all of our ministries. Making disciples has to be at the forefront of all we do because we want to be obedient to the commission that he's given us. In just a few weeks, in, uh, in mid-November, we're going to be taking all of our pastoral team on a two-and-a-half-day retreat. Now, we're a little bit afraid of that because the last staff retreat we went on, we came back to Little Rock, and COVID hit. And all that we planned was absolutely worthless. But we're going again in November, and most of that time is going to be spent looking forward, determining what are the next steps in our ministries. Well, as we do that, our, our major metric, our primary evaluation is going to be to look at our mission, which is to glorify God by making disciples, and, and ask the question, does this fit into our mission? Now, let's talk about the second part of our mission statement where it defines a disciple. Our mission is to glorify God by making disciples, and the second part says a disciple is one who loves God and loves others. Now, that sounds pretty simple, right? Is it scriptural? Is that what the Bible teaches about or, or, or how a Bible describes the disciples? Is that the picture or the, the end product of discipling? You know, believe it or not, those four simple words, love God and love others, paint a very comprehensive picture of what a disciple should be. Look with me in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to look at verses 34 through 40. While you're turning there, let me mention two of Jesus' references to being a disciple. In John chapter 8, verse 31, he, to his disciples, he spoke to his disciples and said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then over in John 14, 15, Jesus said to them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, there are a lot of commandments in Scripture. How do we know, how do we possibly know if we're on track, if we're being obedient? Jesus answers that question here in Matthew 22. And in Matthew 22, we have a very concise picture of a disciple. Verse 34, Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, just some quick background about this passage. You remember that the religious leaders hated Jesus. The leaders of his day hated him. They were incredibly jealous of him. 
For one thing, he continually pointed out the hypocrisy of their religious practice, the fact that it was just outward. It was just religious practice. They didn't, they didn't love God. That wasn't something that was in their hearts. He had bigger crowds following him, so he was much more popular. He, he taught with authority they didn't have. When Jesus taught, people said, wow, we've never heard teaching with such authority. And then, of course, his miracles validated him and his message. And so the religious leaders, and especially the Pharisees, wanted to kill him. In fact, they were plotting, trying to figure out a way to do that. But they were concerned about his popularity with the people. They couldn't just up and, and uh, take him out. They were concerned about that. So what they would do is they would often try to publicly discredit him. And this is actually, in this chapter, if you look back in Matthew 22, they've tried two previous times to trip him with trick questions. And so this third time, the question's about the law. If you know anything about the religious leaders, especially the Pharisees, they loved their laws. In fact, they loved their laws more than God, and they loved their laws more than people. They loved to talk about how incredibly righteous they were in keeping the laws, which was just a farce. They didn't keep the laws. In the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, there are 613 letters. Please don't tune me out and start counting letters, okay? Your Bible's in English. I'm talking about in the Hebrew. 613 letters in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments. And so the Pharisees came up with 613 corresponding laws. There were 365 negative laws, that was one for each day of the year, an additional 248 affirmative laws, one for each part of the body. They had lighter laws, which were semi-optional, and then they had heavy laws, which were binding so here they're trying to trap Jesus by getting him to say that one law was more important than the other. But in spite of what they're trying to do, this is really a pretty good question. It would be difficult to try to keep up with every law that called for obedience. And so in asking which command, which law is most important, this, this lawyer, this expert in the law gives us an opportunity to have a very clear picture of discipleship of what it truly means to follow Jesus. He, he's the one who said, my disciples abide in my word. He's the one who said, those who love me keep my commands. Now he tells us exactly how to do that. Look again at verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, notice, Jesus hasn't changed the law. He hasn't created some new law. He hasn't said that the law God had already laid down in Scripture in the Old Testament was not important or didn't matter. In fact, he's actually quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting the Scripture most familiar to God's people, the nation of Israel. He's quoting, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, which says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It's not a new law. Our mission statement says God is glorified when we make disciples who love God. Well, what does it look like to love God? How do we know if we're truly loving God? The Hebrew word back in Deuteronomy 6, which Jesus was quoting from, the Hebrew word for love is ahav. It's a bit hard to describe. You know that in Greek and Hebrew, there, especially in the Greek, there are many words for love. We have one in English, but I will tell you, it definitely refers, when it talks about loving God, it definitely refers to more than just an emotion. It, it's intense loyalty, it's, it's dedication, it's loving God more than anything or anyone else. But you notice he doesn't just say you should love God with all that you are. He says a bit more than that, and if, if you're in a marriage or a committed relationship, you understand that love is more than emotion. It denotes commitment and, and dedication and action. And so he says you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Why doesn't he just say love God with all that you've got? Listen, if you're a parent, you know why. You probably had a child who, when you did not state everything explicitly, would frequently get off the rails. For example, if you said to your child, maybe your child had been sitting in front of the, the big screen TV half the morning, you said to your child, okay, that's enough, no more television today. That very child you might find five minutes later on an iPhone or an iPad or whatever, doing what? Watching some programming. Why? Because you didn't say, no more television, no programs on the iPhone, no programs on the iPhone. You, you know what I'm talking about. You had to list every single thing because whatever you didn't specifically mention uh, to do or not do, he was going to do or not do. And so he's very specific in this commandment, but bottom line is he's saying we're to love God with all we've got. 
with our emotions, with our thoughts, with our volition, with our intelligence, our desires, our intention and will, with our words and actions, with our service, everything in us should express our love for God. So what's God trying to say to his people in Deuteronomy? What is, what is Jesus communicating here? What he's communicating is God is not looking for people who know how to go through the motions. God is not looking for people who can, who can play the game. He's not looking for those who can perform religious rituals and give the appearance of loving him. It's not what's apparent on the outside, but it's what's genuine on the inside that God looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at what? He looks at the heart. You may remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about worship and the fact that genuine worship, when we come in this place, is not just about singing the songs, saying the right things, going through the motions. Genuine worship also includes our thoughts and our attitudes. In Isaiah 29, God told his people he didn't want their lip service. He didn't want their worship, which was rituals or rules made up by men. He didn't want worship or hypocritical acts of love from people whose hearts are far from him. It's not what he's looking for. It's not, it's not what we do. It's the motivation and the attitude and the thought and the love behind what we do. God loved us with his whole being. God loved us with everything he's got. He gave us everything by saving us. And you know, if he never did another good thing, and most of this room could count off many blessings since we've been saved, but he, if he never did another good thing beyond saving us and ever blessed us in any other way, that would be enough. God loved us with everything he had, and he doesn't want our half-hearted love in, in return. A true disciple loves God completely. He desires to be with God and spend time with him. He, he, he trusts him completely. He desires to be obedient in all things. Now, will a true disciple sin? Will a true disciple disobey? Yes. But out of our love for God, if we truly love him completely, when we sin, when we disobey, when the Spirit of God convicts us, we'll repent and we'll pursue a continuing love for God with our whole being. That's how you can tell if someone really truly belongs to Christ. It's not whether or not they ever sin. It's what happens when they sin. It's whether they go on living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. They may have claimed the name of Christ with their lips, but if they're able to live a continual lifestyle of sin, Christ is not Lord of life. The true believer, the true disciple, loves God to the point that their sin, when the Spirit convicts them of sin, their sin, the conviction of that, grieves them, and so they willingly, quickly repent and pursue a love relationship with God with their whole being. Our mission statement says, God is glorified when we make disciples who love God, secondly, who love others. Notice what Jesus said about the second commandment. The first commandment, the greatest commandment, is to love God. The second is like it. It's like the first. What does that mean? It, it kind of follows the same track. It's of the same nature as the first command, meaning we're also to devote ourselves to this command. We're not just to give it a passing acknowledgement, but uh, an occasional attempt, but to be fully devoted, not only to loving God, but to what? Loving our neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Honestly, if you, if you love God rightly, this is not too difficult. The problem is all of us are basically lovers of self. We're concerned about our own comfort. We're concerned about our own needs. We have goals that we're working toward, and we don't want anyone to, to get in the way. See, truly loving others means that you look to meet their needs as readily and as willingly and as quickly and as completely as you want your own needs met. You know, we can say, yeah, I care about others. I love others. I meet their needs. But do I meet their needs at the same level I seek to have my own needs met? That readily, that quickly, that completely. The unfortunate thing when it comes to loving others is we're all quite human, aren't we? I was thinking this week as I thought about loving others, about an experience I had several years ago down in Mexico. We, uh, Doug Shelby was with me. We were checking out a new project. Now, where we used to work on the border, I was very familiar with the city, could find my way around, could find something to eat. We were kind of in the interior. We were in an area where there weren't uh, places to eat didn't know what was safe to eat. And so we're at this little church, and, and we're looking at the project, and they say, well, hey, we're, we're going to feed you. Um, 
Poblano Rieno, stuffed peppers. So we're, we're in the little worship center. They don't have a big complex like we do. And out the side door, they have fired up a, uh, like a fish cooker. Oh, and it was clearly a fish cooker. That grease, that oil hadn't been changed in who knows when. It reeked of fish. And that's what they're going to deep fry these peppers in. On top of that, I'm going to tell you something. Y'all will wear me out on this, but I, Whatever. Those peppers are stuffed with ground beef and cheese. Now, I'm a picky eater, but there are reasons. I don't eat ground beef. I'll eat a hamburger. My grandmother immigrated here from Sicily. Phenomenal Italian cook. If she made spaghetti and meatballs, I'd eat it. If she ground up the beef in the sauce and it was kind of loose, I I wasn't touching it. Because when I was 17, I got poisoning, food poisoning from a taco. Now, that was 43 years ago, but I hadn't forgotten it. So you got these peppers being cooked in this nasty, rancid oil that fish has been cooked in, and they have ground beef stuffed in them. Now, I'm, I'm in a place where I can't afford to offend our host, so I know I'm going to have to somehow hide it or eat it. One of the brothers says, let me pray. Now, they pray a little bit longer than we do. Please don't judge me for my mind wandering. You know your mind wanders in a long prayer, too. So he's praying. Oh, I didn't mention this. They bring our plates to the table. Mine is this big. Doug's is this big. Yeah, and that's how they do in these countries. If you're the jefe, if you're the boss, man, they treat you like royalty. So they think they're doing me a great favor. The guy starts praying. I had my head bowed, but my eyes were open. I I could not miss... And then I'm thinking, I'd like to tell you this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me, but when you hear the end result, you know it wasn't the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Poor Doug. He's not even on our staff at this point. He's taken a week of his vacation to come and, and help with this project. That may not be enough to hold him over (laughs) until dinner. His eyes were closed. (laughs) Listen, Doug was so thankful, so excited. You know how I know that? The minute we looked up from the prayer, his eyes got this big. (laughs) That's the absolute truth. I wish I could tell you I was making up the story. That's the absolute truth. That's how much I cared about my brother. I wanted to be sure he had enough to eat. Okay, seriously. The greatest explanation of how we love others is in Paul's epistle to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. These are great memory verses, especially if you have children at home. These these are just great verses to help us love others. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Listen, but in humility, consider others more significant or more important than yourselves. Look each of you, not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Being a, being a disciple, a Christ follower, isn't that complicated. Love God, love men. You don't have to know 613 different laws. Why? Because in the same passage, if you look down at verse 40, Jesus said, all the law hangs on these two commands. What's he saying? Take a look at the Ten Commandments. The first floor reflect love for God and the actions that express your love for him, and the last six reflect a love for man. There's the whole law, just those four little words, love God, love others. That's why we exist to make disciples who love God and love others. If you love God, you'll obey his commands. That's what a disciple is called to do. If you love men, you'll meet their needs. You love God, you obey his commands. If you love men, you'll meet their needs. Every other command in Scripture is just an explanation of how we do those two things. So that's who or that's what a disciple is, someone who loves God wholeheartedly and someone who loves others unselfishly. That's our mission as Geyer Springs Baptist Church, to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. And if we're going to achieve that mission starts with us. We have to be disciples who love God and love others. 
Let me just mention again a couple of verses I've mentioned before just as a summary. And if you're not a note taker, that's fine. But you might want to just jot down these two references just to remember our mission and what we've talked about today. In Isaiah 29, 13, God's charge against his people was that they honored him with their lips, with rules made by men, but their hearts were far from him. They didn't love him. They didn't love him. Maybe they feared him. They did all the right things, all the religious things, the rituals they needed to do, but they didn't love him. Their hearts were far from him. And then 1 John 3, 18, John said to believers, to Christ followers, hey, let's not love with word and with tongue, but in deed or with action and with truth. Gower Springs exists to make disciples who love God and love others. That won't happen unless the followers of Christ that are part of this body love God and love others. Would you bow with me? Anytime we gather and we hear from God's word, not the pastor's words, but from the word of God, we need to think about what God has told us in his word. We need to take time to to meditate on what his word has said and then to ask ourselves, what am I going to do in in response to that? Am am I a person that's a picture of what it looks like to truly love God? Do I really love God with my whole heart, with every part of my being? Am I I one of those people that just goes through the motions and shows up on Sunday and and uh, just says the right things and sings the songs, or do I truly love God wholeheartedly every day? Is he first and foremost? Do I desire to be with him? Do I desire to obey? doesn't mean you won't ever fall short or fail, but the attitude of your heart when you find yourself in sin is to repent and to return to pursuing a relationship with God, loving him with your whole heart. And then what about loving others? Jesus said the second commandment is like the first. Obviously, the first is most important. God comes before anything. But the second commandment is equally important, and it should be something that we are pursuing as aggressively as loving God, and that is that the love of God flows through us so that we love others. I know some are hard to love. I get that. But we're to love others as we love ourselves. That means when we see a need, we're quick to it. We don't hold back. We don't just do what's necessary. We do what we would want done for us. So those are our two points of evaluation this morning. Am I a disciple who loves God and loves others? Because God cannot move this church forward. God cannot bless our ministries if we're not loving God and loving others ourselves. We can't ask someone else to be what we're not. So take a moment this morning. What has the Holy Spirit said? How do you need to respond?